Good evening. I, I, I appreciate all of you guys being here tonight. Uh, so I just before I uh, get rolling here, I just want to kind of give my little disclaimer. Um, this is the many a time now that I've kind of done a comparative religion kind of thing where we're kind of looking at other religious views. And my goal is, as always, is, is never to disparage anyone or to put anyone down for what they believe or anything like that. Um, my goal is always to come and just to present information, to give truth. Um, you probably may not agree with everything that I say tonight. Um, that's fine if you don't. Um, if you do, well, praise God. Um, and some things may be a little challenging for you, even those of you in here who are uh, walking with the Lord. Um, the, there are areas of our lives where we, um, where maybe there, everything is not maybe as it should be. Uh, so, just to say, if, if I offend you, I'm not sorry. Um, but if you have questions about anything that I say, um, I, like, like, uh, like was said just a few minutes ago, I am more than happy to talk with you afterwards and, and you can tell me why I'm wrong and I'm, I'll be more than happy to listen. So, um, with that said, um, I'm going to get started. So, what is the New Age Movement, right? You all saw the flyer, uh, it's kind of mostly why we're here. Um, the New Age Movement was not started in the 1960s per se, but it became popular in the 1960s, along with all of the other different movements and revolutions and the different isms that were going on in the 1960s, um, the hippie movement, the feminist movement, all that, and all the other different isms. And at its heart, the New Age movement is kind of this synchronistic belief system, which is just a fancy way to say it's all this stuff that's just kind of mixed together into one like giant salad bowl. Um, of beliefs, and then you kind of can get to pick and choose whatever you want, right? Um, the uh, popular mantra back in the 60s, right, that we're in the age of Aquarius, that time of wonderful peace and love and happiness when everyone will just get along and we'll all sing Kumbaya, and, and the old order of things is gone, and now we have a new order of things, and everything will be better. Now, it, just in case you're wondering, astronomically, the age of Aquarius doesn't start until like the you know 2300s, so I don't think any of us will be in the room for the actual age of Aquarius, um, should the Lord tarry. But uh, hey, there we go. But at its heart, the New Age men movement will will blend these different beliefs, right? It'll take pagan practices. It'll take occult. It'll take Eastern mysticism. Okay. It'll take and it'll throw in kind of a splash of popular religion. So they're using the same kind of vocabulary, so that when you approach it, it doesn't feel familiar or off. So they might even like use Jesus, or they'll use maybe Christian terms, so that it feels friendly and, and familiar to you. Um, and this is kind of the hard thing. It's really hard to pin down. It's really hard to critique. The New Age doesn't have like a, a Ten Commandments that you can look at and kind of go point by point and say, this is, this is the problem with this, this is the problem with that. It, it really is kind of just this catch-all religion in so many ways. It, it's really amorphous. It's like trying to nail jello to a wall, okay? Or trying to just grab a cloud. Um, and in that is also the appeal of the New Age because it can be anything you need it and want it to be. It can be all things to all people. It can be whatever you want. And therein, again, is the appeal. There are no rules other than like progressive tolerance where everyone loves each other and gets along and all religions are the same and we all coexist together. Um, outside of that, there's really no rules. And when you have no rules, it's just basically power. When it, what it ultimately comes down to is power and control. And it can easily appeal to one's vanity and one's ego at its heart. Um, and so when you boil it all down, all the different beliefs kind of come down to one point. You're God. Little G God, capital G God, you're God. Okay? Man is divine because the universe is divine. Okay? Everything, all of the physical and all the spiritual, all the atoms, all the protons, everything in the universe, all the matter of, of creation is God. Okay? If this sounds like Eastern mysticism, because it is. If this sounds like Star Wars and George Lucas and the Force, it's because it is. Okay? Lucas didn't create anything new. He just, he just took it from the Hindus and the Buddhists. Um, and he called it the Force. 
But at, at its heart, that's what it is. And because we are made up of stuff of the universe, we are physically divine, and we are spiritually divine. And so man is God. And it encourages exploration of that deity, right? I'm going to get personal enlightenment. I'm going to just sit, and I'm going to chant, and I'm going to go Om, even not realizing that actually Om is the name of a little g-god, so you're actually invoking a demon when you do that. But um, this includes meditation, visualization. I think it, I see it, and like I, I, I want to come into existence. If I believe it hard enough, it will happen. Um, affirmation, I speak it and it comes into being because of the power of my words. I manifest reality to bend to my will. And arguably most dangerous of all, channeling, where you talk to your spirit guide. And your spirit guide will either talk to you or come into you and then speak through you. Um, the Bible calls that demon possession. So you are talking to a spirit and he is guiding you, but it's not in a place you want to go. And it's definitely not something you really want to do. And there's all kinds of books out there that claim to be channeled writing. So they're either lying or there's a demon working through them for some automatic writing. Um, what does this look like in America? How does this play out in our materialistic culture? The most common way that this plays out is the law of attraction. Okay? which is basically kind of just a repackaged version of the Western understanding of karma, which is, I do good, good things happen to me. I do bad, bad things happen to me. Um, and so if you, through positive talking, positive thinking, you affirm, you, you basically manifest your reality into being. Okay? Um, people, they'll even, the practitioners of this will even quote Jesus, or they'll quote Bible verses. They'll take them out of their context and they'll twist them, but they'll use verses like ask, seek, knock, and it will be given to you. So if I just you know, seek the universe, the universe will give me what I want, um, that I reap what I sow. Yeah, there is some truth in that. Um, if you treat other people like trash, they're probably going to treat you like trash. Not always. If, you, if you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you, most of the time. Um, and the power in the tongue, right? Doesn't the Bible say we have power in our words? There's power in the tongue? Yes, but the Bible understanding of that is way different than the New Age understanding of that. When the Bible talks about you have power in your tongue, you know, the power to affirm, the power to build up, and the power to tear down, right? I, I can say awesome, amazing things about Jason over here. I, I can tell him he's the best, he's great, he's amazing. I can build him up with my words and let him feel good. Or I can totally tear him down and destroy him. And I can call him the most evil, vile things there are. And I can just go into a litany of curse words against him and just totally destroy our, our friendship of three years, two years, I don't know, it's been a while. Um, and just totally wreck that friendship in, in five seconds. Those are the power of my words to build up or to destroy. What my words cannot do is rewrite reality to my will. Okay, Our words, we, I am not the God of Genesis 1. You are not the God of Genesis 1. You do not have the power to speak and it come into existence. That is not the power that your tongue has. So big difference between affecting someone's emotions and speaking something out of speaking into the nothingness of the universe and creating something. Um, I want a million dollars. Didn't happen. Tax free. Didn't happen. Sorry. <laughs> um, what does this look like for Jesus? Because we just mentioned Jesus. They, they, they twist Jesus' words and they twist Jesus as well. Okay, um, Jesus is just a man. Uh, he's an enlightened man. He's a guru. He's an avatar. Jesus, uh, the old Greek word is apotheosis, when man becomes God. Um, Jesus had an apotheosis moment. He, he became enlightened through prayer and meditation and other various aesthetic rituals. Jesus ascended. He became an ascended master. Um, he achieved a level of godhood. He became what in the New Age they use today is, is calling it Christ consciousness. So he wasn't born the Christ. He became a Christ. Okay, Not the Christ. A Christ in their view. And the cool thing is for you and me is we can become little Christ as well. 
Um, not because we invite Jesus into our life and the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside us and we're born again. No, no, no. This is a different kind of thing. Um, by doing the same thing Jesus did through meditation and practice and other various ascetic rituals, we too can ascend, evolve, become more spiritually enlightened, reach a higher plane of existence. We too can tap into that uh, Christ consciousness, right? We can become uh, one with the force. <laughs> We can become more divine than we already are. With our mind and our will and our emotions and our spoken words, we can visualize it, we can speak it, and we can manifest that into existence. And if that sounds weird for you, there's a lot of famous people who believe it. I'm not saying they're right, I'm just saying there's a lot of people who believe it. Oprah, Deepak Choker, Marianne Williamson. Um, and it kills me as a Packers fan, but Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Green Bay, ex, thank God, ex quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, he, he believes this. Hasn't helped them to win a Super Bowl in 14 years, but he believes this. You sound a little bitter there, Brad. <laughs> You're saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're not wrong. <laughs> when you boil it all down, though, it's serpent language. It is Genesis 3 repackaged in modern times. You shall be as God. It's serpent language. It always goes back to Genesis 3. Always, always, always. The end result is kind of this really weird mix of Judeo-Christian beliefs and words, Eastern religions and beliefs, mixed with spiritualism and Gnosticism, okay? If you know your Bible, you know Gnosticism shows up a lot, but Gnosticism at its heart is kind of just twofold. One, what you do in the body doesn't matter, only the spirit matters. So in Jesus' day, you could go visit the brothel and do whatever you want in your body because all that matters is what you do with your spirit. That's, that, that's what matters. The flesh is corrupt and counts for nothing. It's only the spirit. The other part of Gnosticism is secret knowledge that you know something that other people don't, and it's your knowledge that saves you. It's not who you know that saves you, Jesus, it's what you know. You have top secret classified information that other normal people don't have, and, and that makes you special. That's Gnosticism. And all of this mixes together, and you can kind of just cherry pick what you want. Um, so here's the information. And you might be thinking, okay, what's the point of all of this? You just told us about the New Age movement. You described kind of just the uh, nuts and bolts to, of it to us. It can, we can go way further down the rabbit hole, but I'm trying to keep everything superficial for, for the sake of time. Um, but what's the point? Well, this is the point. This is why you're here. This is why I'm here. This is the heart of the matter. Um, the only thing that really matters on this chart that I really want you to care about is the first two parts. Now that is the fact that 6 in 10 Americans, just any American across the entire country, from California to New York, 6 in 10 Americans, whether they are religious or not, believe in at least one New Age belief, whether that's psychics, reincarnation, astrology, tarot, belief that um, energy, spiritual energy can exist in crystals and things. The, the, the other stat to that is not just 6 in 10 Americans believe that, 6 in 10 people in the church believe that. 60% of Christians across our country believe that. Every other piece of information is just the breakdown of that main stat. So Protestants, Evangelicals, Catholics, etc., etc. In America, the percentage is almost exactly the same. 62 to 61% believe in at least one New Age belief. At least one. That is astounding. And you want, if you ask the question, well, why? Well, this same poll later on revealed about only about 10% of uh, people who profess Christianity as their main practice read their Bible on a daily basis. The other 90% don't of confessing Christians. So I think there's a correlation between biblical ignorance and this, belief, and this stat? Absolutely there is. Um, and it gets worse. Uh, the only thing you really need to pay full attention to up here is the red and the blue, the light blue. The, the, the red is 2021, the light blue is 2023, so last year. 
And, and what this is, is Gen Z. So right now, basically all teenagers, seventh grade and older, are Gen Z. If, you're, if you have kids who are sixth grade and younger, they are Gen Alpha. Um, so basically people in their teens and 20s are Gen Z, 30s, 40s, etc., are uh, millennials, and etc. But here's the point. Right after COVID in, in, in 2021, 16% um, 16% of Gen Z said that they were practicing Christian. And, de and this pew uh, um, definition of practicing Christian is you go to church at least once a month, whether in person or online, and you say that faith is important to you. That is their low bar of practicing Christian. So Gen Z, practicing Christian, 16%. In 2023, just last year, it was 13%. Non-practicing Christian, your, your priesters, people who go to you know, church on Christmas and Easter, or they don't go at all. Um, for Gen Z, that was 48%. So they say they're a Christian, but they're Christian because they believe in God. That's usually that definition. It went from 48 to 41% in those same three years. People who are not Christian, however, went up in the Gen Z age range. It went from 36 to 46% in the last three years. I didn't say they were atheists. I didn't say they were agnostic. They could be anything spiritually, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever. No religious affiliation whatsoever, but they're spiritual in their new age. That is going up. The other interesting stat that I, didn't, I forgot to put in here, but there's been a flip. Throughout all of pretty much American history, it's always been, in terms of people who leave the church, it's always been men who've been the majority. Gen Z is the first generation in American history where actually women are leaving the church at a faster rate than men. Um, it's about 55% right now. Um, the good news in that, though, is the men who are staying in the church are more hungry and more gung-ho for God than ever before. Um, and, and that is cool because... When the father gets saved, typically the entire family gets saved shortly after. When, when mom gets saved, it, could, it can pretty much be a mixed bag of who and who will not get saved. But when dad is a Christian, typically the rest of the family becomes Christian shortly thereafter. So that's an encouraging thing in the midst of some things that are not so encouraging. Um, Again, as far as when this breaks down, everything in light blue and dark blue is dark blue is basically 12 and under. Light blue is teenage years. Yellow tan is in their 20s, and dark yellow is in uh, their 30s or older. So the one on the left side, right here, would be um, Gen Z, millennials, people in their 30s and 40s are the second one. Uh, Gen X is you know, people in their 50s, 60s, uh, they're right there. And then on the far end are our baby boomers, basically people 65 and older. And if you look just very simply from where we are on Gen Z to the other side, you'll see that most of the people, Gen Z, when they leave the church, it happens before they're 18 years old. Whereas baby boomers, most of them, when they left the church, it was in their adult years. And... Um, Gen X and Millennials, it kind of breaks down kind of evenly between each age group. It's a very fascinating study. However, this is important. Young people aren't becoming atheists. They are le replacing God in the church for spirituality, Wicca, and the New Age, most of them. And the question then becomes, well, why? Why are they doing this, right? Gen Z, swapping traditional faith for magic spells. Even the Catholics are having this problem. Gen Z is swapping uh, traditional Catholic faith, and they're bringing in tarot, and they're bringing in other New Age, and they're mixing it together with their Catholicism. Um, other Christian things, right? Even the secular news. NBC News did an article on this a few years ago about how fast... Um, the New Age movement is growing among Gen Z, right? The witchcraft and all that's growing. Now, given that this article is, that this is happening in Salem, Massachusetts, okay, with the witch population is going up in Salem. So I'll grant you that. Um, for those of you who get the joke there, good for you. Um, but but it's, it's happening everywhere around the country, too. It's not just unique to one uh, small little Massachusetts town. And the, the question is, why? 
Why is Gen Z so attracted to this? Right? And ultimately, well, it's really easy when you think about it. Gen Z and children and young, young people in general are powerless. Think of how many people in their 20s, like, oh, I can't find a house right now. How many people still live with their parents? How many people are just starting off in their career so they have no financial power? They have no job power? They, they have no power in general because maybe they're just kids and living with their parents? But this offers them power. This offers them freedom. Again, they can believe whatever they want. There are no rules. And this is very, very appealing. And when you think about it, at a deeper level, humans are inherently materialistic and selfish. That's incredibly obvious. I don't have to tell you that. Um, everyone in here is selfish. The only difference is, compared to us and little kids, many of you in here are just better at hiding it. Amen. <laughs> they might throw a tantrum when they don't get what they want. You do too. But because you don't want to be embarrassed in front of your peers and others, you hold it in until, <coughs> until you get to the car. <laughs> then on the way home, you, you have your moment. <laughs> but think about this. Gen Z and, and, and millennials, as far as material stuff, and you, you baby boomers in here, you know this. Think of what you had when you were a kid and think of all the stuff that your grandkids have now. This generation of kids has more stuff than any generation of humans who have ever lived on planet Earth, period. And yet, my generation, millennials, and their generation, Gen Z and younger, they are the most empty generation, the most hungry generation, completely unsatisfied. They have more stuff than anyone, and yet they are more hungry, more spiritually bankrupt than any generation that has ever lived. We have, all of you have one of these on you somewhere. You are more connected than any generation of humans who ever lived. I can call up Japan, I can call up China, I can call up South Africa, England, whoever, I have a friend in some other country, I can call them up in three seconds. We are more connected than we have ever been. We have all this social media, and yet most young people don't even know how to socialize. We, have, we are so connected, and yet we have never been so lonely. We have more stuff, and yet we have never been so empty. Why? Well, it's a conversation for another day, perhaps. But do you think it's going to be easier for Gen Alpha? Those people who are six, in sixth grade and younger? Or is it going to be harder? Are they going to be better or are they going to be worse? This is where the New Age movement comes in. Because they step in and they say, hey, we can fill that spiritual emptiness while making no demands for a physical or moral change. You don't have to pick up your cross and follow me. You don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to stop doing this or that. You can still continue to be as sinful and selfish as you want to be while still having, allegedly having, your spiritual needs and hunger met. But it's like spiritual Chinese food. It'll fill you up and you'll get full from your big buffet. But what happens an hour later? You're hungry again, right? You've all been, you've all been there. You know what I'm talking about. That's, that's what this comes down to, right? Makes no demand for a change will satisfy, or at least claiming to, satisfy that hunger. And at the same time, it tries to offer questions, answers to the questions they may have about material things, about spiritual things. Wrong answers, but answers that the church has been pretty silent and pretty, uh, honestly, crappy about answering in, in the last 20, 30 years. Whether that's about evil and suffering, no one wants to talk about hell. God forbid we do that. Um, gender roles, sexuality, spiritual phenomenon, occult beliefs, UFOs. God forbid we talk about those. People think we're weird. So what are the practical examples? What are the things that they're into? What are they doing? Well, not an exhaustive list, but one worth mentioning. Um, practices and items would include crystals, meditation, astrology, witchcraft, white and dark, tarot cards, psychics, channeling, yoga, yes, yoga. If that makes you mad or you're offended, I'm happy to talk with you about that afterwards. Um, it, yoga is a Hindu word that means yoke. 
What are you yoking yourself to? What are you joining yourself to? Well, I just like to exercise. Great. I wish I did. Obviously, I don't. You can look at me and tell that. But there's, there's, there's gyms and there's other places I hear about. I've never been to one. But um, I, I hear you can go to them and work out without every pose you make in yoga is, is to a god. There's 100 million gods in Hindu. And every pose you do is, honestly, it's just worship to that god, which is a, nothing but a demon and an idol. If that offends you, like I said, I'm happy to have the conversation with you at the end. I'm happy to hear. Uh, reincarnation, astral projection, defying the earth. I love clean water and clean air as much as the next guy, but I'm not going to resort to environmental Gaia worship. Mother Earth and all that. Uh, belief in third eye enlightenment, belief in uh, universal forces like karma and chi, and sometimes even you know, belief in aliens, etc. Um, I, I do want to quickly just say something about tarot cards. Do you know they've Christianized them? You can buy these things called destiny cards. Some churches will bring people and they'll do Christianized tarot cards and they'll get rid of the original 27 pictures on there and they'll put like Moses or Elijah or Jesus or something on them and they'll sell them and they'll do people's fortune telling with destiny cards. In Genesis 1, God called things good after he made them. Human sin and satanic activity corrupted the things that God made good. You can redeem that which was once good and has been perverted and corrupted. We are the ultimate example of that. Okay? Jesus came to earth to redeem and save that which, which God once called good, but was contaminated by sin. And God redeemed that on the cross. However, things that God calls an abomination in his word, satanic practices, demonic activities, things that God calls evil are evil. And just because you throw the word Christian in front of it with a hyphen does not make it good. You cannot redeem the occult. You cannot redeem that which was never good. And putting the word Christian in front of tarot is just plain stupid. I'm sorry. And it's blasphemous and it's wrong. You cannot redeem that which God called evil from the beginning. <clears throat> now, when you go through that list, some of you may say, well, a lot of those things seem absurd. And you're right. A lot of those things on that list are absurd. Pop culture, our country and society in general will say, eh, most of those things are innocent. Who cares if someone goes talk to some psychic or something? It's innocent. It's harmless at best, and it's quirky and strange. Oh, he believes in aliens or something. Who cares? Um, at, at worst. My simple question to you is, how often is the world right? Really? How often has the world been right? Humans, especially children, we have a curiosity about these things, right? We get easily fascinated by spiritual matters, right? For those of you in here who go to church on a regular basis, if your pastor got up on Sunday morning and said, I'm going to be starting a Bible study. We're going to be going through the book of Revelation. We're going to be talking about the end times. People who've never been to Bible study a day in their life suddenly are going to show up. Why? Because they have a fascination with the end. They have a fascination when, when the ultimate good takes on the ultimate evil in the final days of human history. We have an, we, we're, we're, we're obsessed with that. So what happens, though, when that curiosity turns to dabbling and flirting? And what happens when that, just, you know, testing it out to see what happens, turns into actually full-blown practice? Which according to the sin, or excuse me, which according to the Bible, that is sin. So I, I want to run this hypothetical by you real quick. Okay? What if there's a kid, we'll, we'll say he's about 12 or 13, what, what if he's going to some dead legalistic church and then he goes to spend the night at a friend's house and his friend says, hey man, I, uh, I got a Ouija board or something. You want to you try it out with me? I, I, I was Googling some things online. Uh, we can do this occult practice. Let's see what happens. What happens if they actually do experience something spiritual? And it's cool. It's, it's, it seems good. They're like, my friend couldn't do it, but I could. Whoa, I can talk to spirits. My friend can, I can. Hmm, I'm special. You feel powerful. It feels forbidden, right? I'm not allowed to do this. All the more reason why I want to do it, because I can't. I'm not allowed. 
And then he, he goes to church the following week, and he, he tries asking his youth pastor or something about it. And they just dismiss it as nonsense, or it was just your imagination, or something like that. And annoyed with his answer, this young man goes home and he does it again on his own. And he has another experience, and then another, and another, and another. And soon, you know what? He just leaves his church entirely. Because they never fed him spiritually. But this, this feels real. This feels fun. This feels empowering. It feels that spiritual hunger he has in ways his old church never could. And he goes down the rabbit hole for years and years. And then one day, he finds himself so heavily involved into the occult and in the New Age, and those once friendly spirits that he thought he controlled, he suddenly realizes they're not so friendly. In fact, this whole time, he thought he was the puppet master and they were the marionettes doing his, his bidding. But now he finally understands the truth. He's the puppet. They are controlling his strings. And he finds himself scared and trapped, and he doesn't know any way out. He needs Jesus more than ever to set him free. Who will tell him? Will you? I, I give you this hypothetical because in preparation for this over the last few months, and just my curiosity about it over the years, um, to, to learn about this. Not just reading books or watching videos, but actually listening to ex-New Agers. Actually um, just hearing stories from so many people who were in this, and then came out of it and became Christian. And then you like watch their testimonies on YouTube or whatever, or you just talk to them in person. This is basically the blueprint archetype for almost all of their stories. They grew up in the church, they experienced something supernatural or weird, they couldn't explain it, church had no answer for them, or they just wanted to ignore it, because we don't. that's too weird to talk about. And they left the church, and they got so far involved in the occult, and they were hearing voices telling them to go kill themselves or others, or to do some kind of other evil, horrible thing. And then God does something awesome and miraculous and saves them. They come out of the darkness into the light, and for like 90% of them, this is basically the, the bones of their story. Variations here and there, but this is basically the outline of their testimony. Almost all of them. And what does the Bible say about these practices, right? Have you ever heard in church your pastor like just get up and flatly say, and I'm, I'm not saying this against anyone in here, I'm just flatly saying like, Leviticus and Deuteronomy don't get preached on in too many churches in America these days. So let me do it real quick for you. Let there be no one among you who sacrifices their sons or daughters to the fire. Do not practice sorcery. Do not practice divination. Do not engage in witchcraft or omens. Or do not cast spells. Do not go to mediums and spiritualists. Do not consort with the dead. Necromancy. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord God. Don't do them. Well, that was just for Israel. That's not for the church. Paul says exactly the same thing, just more colorful. Um, don't be yoked with unbelievers in this way. You cannot put righteousness and wickedness together. You can't yoke Christ and Satan together. No more than you can put light and darkness together. Which brings me up on my real quick, uh, those of you who are here, who, well, what about like the yin-yang symbol? I got like half white, half dark. Real, are, are Satan and Jesus equal forces? Yes, one is good and one is evil, but they are not equal forces. Well, and the white side, oh, well, the white side has a little piece of black circle in it. So you're saying that, that Jesus has a, a piece of darkness in him? No. Oh, well, the, white, the dark side that represents Satan, well, 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 that has a little white circle in it. Well, does that represent, does that mean that Satan has good in him? No. So just that yin-yang symbol that so many of us love to wear, even that, well, you know, that duality and that, no. It's blasphemy, and why would you want to wear it, Christian? Just going down that rabbit hole. You, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot have part at the table of the Lord and the table of demons. These two things are not compatible. Do not try to make them so. Please. And if you think that this hasn't crept into the church, it has. Sometimes it's obvious we do things like affirmations where someone like Benny Hinn or someone like him will get up and say, he'll make this theological jump. Well, Jesus was the I am, 
And we're made in the image of God, and if we're Christians, Jesus is inside us. Therefore, if Jesus is the I am, then I must be the I am as well. It may not be the I am, but I am a I am. And then everyone start chanting I am with me, that I am and I am, right? This is the name of God. So basically you're chanting that I am a God, I am a God, I am a God. They exist, seriously, like go online, go to YouTube and watch it. It's crazy. Again, you cannot Christianize occult practices and start going into some mantra about something and just repeating these sentences. In the end, most people do this because they feel powerless and they want control over their lives or they just want control over others. It ultimately it comes back to power and ego. Less obvious, self-help, positive thinking. There's a lot of pastors in America today who are, honestly, if we're being honest, are, are just no better than motivational speakers. None of the pastors in this room. I'm not saying you guys. You guys are awesome. I love you guys. Um, I wouldn't go to your church if you were. So, um, But when you hear phrases like, oh, well, you're perfect just the way you are, or Jesus loves you just the way you are. Well, yeah, yes, he does, but he does. But that's not the full story. Or, oh, follow your heart. Let's make it a Disney movie. Just listen to your heart. Um, or, you know, just be yourself. No. Jesus didn't say, follow your heart. He said, follow me. In fact, he said, your heart is the cause of much sin and destruction in your life. And yes, he loves you the way you are, kind of. He, he loves you enough to not leave you the way you are because he knows what you are. And you know what you are, too. You know the person that you are. Not the person you pretend to be in front of others, but who you really are. And you know that you need a Savior. And that's why He came. Okay? We are not perfect as we are. That's literally why He came. Because we are not perfect. We cannot save ourselves. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He was perfect. We're not. He can. We can't. Period. And we should not be ourselves. No, we should be like Christ. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. Period. Sorry, getting a little passionate here. Um, if you think it's not in the music, it's in the music, right? So this is uh, Corey Asbury. He's the one who sings the song Reckless Love of God. He has other ones, but I think that's his most famous one. A few years ago during COVID, he was talking, oh, I've been so depressed and so sad recently, but I started reading this amazing book by Richard Rohr. He's a great Christian. He teaches us so many awesome great things. No, Richard Rohr is a new age occultist who, who basically is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He uses Christian language, but he's a New Age occultist, period, end of discussion. He literally wrote a book called The Universal Christ, okay? Whenever you see the word universal like that, it should be red flags, all right? It's like it's as red flag as Christ consciousness. In his book, Rohr says, oh, Jesus is the amalgam, the amalgamation of all matter and spirit. Isn't that how we describe the New Age at the beginning? Just all the stuff in the universe? So Jesus is the force. Cool. Yeah. Um, anything that drives you out of yourself in a positive way is operating as God for you. So anytime you experience anything good, eh, that's as good as God. And this one is crazy. Um, every time you choose love, you are in touch with the divine personality. You don't even need to call it God. So when I do things I love, that's close enough to God. You know, there are some islands in the world where they love cannibalism. Would you call that cannibalism God? Maybe that's a little too uh, extension, uh, too, too uh, extreme of an example. Some of you, you in here have maybe addictions to things. What about other people who have addictions to things? Do you call alcoholism your God? I love to drink. I love my drugs. I love my pornography. I love my gossip, ladies. Right? Would you, would you call that God? If you love to do... This is why the Bible is clear. Okay? Love is not God. God is love. It's one of his attributes. But love is not God. But in the New Age, it is. Um, and this is going to probably make some of you mad. <laughs> and that's okay. I'm fine with it. Um, the Shack. It's been a few years now. It's been about 10 years since this movie book came out. And I remember when it came out, it was so popular. There have been other things that have come out recently that are like this, and I'm not mentioning them because they're not as popular as this. I mean, this was super popular. I had so many Christian people come, oh, you should go watch this movie. Oh, this book is amazing. It's not. Um, yes, it is allegorical fiction. 
And it, the author wants to deal with the issues of evil and pain and suffering. In the book, the man, di- his child dies in a horrific way. And he's left with, why God, why? Why did you let my child die this way? Um, and he goes to the shack in the woods. And the Godhead shows up. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Um, and they start talking. The rest of the book is just a conversation between the th- four of them. Um, and this book does have some biblical truths in it, right? Every good lie has a little truth in it. It also has a lot of unbiblical doctrines and New Age t- teachings, too. All right? God the Father appears as a female called Papa. So God the Father appears as a black woman who's called Papa. And she, he, has scars on the Father's hand. It's not the son who has the nail holes. It's the Father who has the nail holes. And the Holy Spirit is called Siriu, which I get spirit and wind are the same word in Hebrew. So instead of using a Hebrew word, he wanted to use one of the Hindu words, which is Siriu. Problem is, Siriu is also the name of one of their gods of goddesses of wind and motion. So in the book, the author is calling the Holy Spirit after a little g god, Hindu god name. Besides twisting the Trinity, Young also marks theological waters by promoting universalism, which is that in the end, everyone will be saved. He gives out pluralism, which means there are multiple ways to be saved. Besides Jesus, everyone will get to God, Jesus or not. And there is no hell. Evil and darkness, they don't exist. Because God is in everything. And God is good, so therefore everything must be good. So there can't be evil and darkness. And I think probably the most insane of all is that God will submit himself to the will of a man. So God is saying to the human, all right, your will be done. Really? I thought God was sovereign on his throne and what he does, no one can stop. And what door he opens, no one can close. And what door he closes, no one can open. Well, no, in his book, he says that God will do what man wants. Really? Willingly. Like, not because he has to, because he wants to. That's dangerous and blasphemous. And if you think this isn't up here in the White Mountains, it is. Like, these are some screenshots um, from Facebook that um, someone sent me. Like, okay, hey, come on now, we're having our uh, metaphysical gatherings, meetups. Let's talk about the New Age. So what I'm trying to tell you is the New Age is up here in the mountains. I mean, you've driven up here, so if you came up here from Shalom, you passed two psychic stores that weren't here when I moved here a decade ago. Um, hey, and guess what? This Saturday, there's, I'm not inviting you to this, I'm just telling you. Um, <laughs> There's a big party this weekend. There's a big gathering in Vernon. And bring your families, because that's how this works, right? We give you the hook. We give you the bait and switch. Here's the, here's the thing, right? We're going to put the unity in community. We're going to have artists and storytellers and comedians and face painters and fire jugglers. It's going to be a great time. Bring your families. This is awesome. Well, what else are they doing? Sound healing, yoga, shamans, oh yay, people who talk to the dead, woo! Um, And psychic readings, and probably palm and tarot reading. And this is the trap, right? They bring you in with the nice stuff, the cool stuff, the family stuff, but underneath the surface, actually, there's a darkness underlining it. And it's right here. It's literally just four days from now. So it's here, it's in the White Mountains. So if you think it's not, oh, it won't affect me maybe in Phoenix or something, but not up here. No, it will. And it is. And it, it's appealing mostly to your kids and your grandkids. So what can I do, right? What, what can I watch out for? Like, what, what do I need to know? Like, give me something. Well, here are some kind of red flags to look out for. When referring to God, if you hear God referred to as a higher power, universal energy, karma, force, Brahma, uh, here God referred to is with female pronouns, um, or God is a greater force, or Christ con any, any way that refers to God other than the Father, or some other biblical title, red flag. Well, how do I know God's biblical titles? Read your Bible. Amen. Sorry, I wasn't trying to be Joe Biden there. I wasn't, sorry. Um, read your Bible. Um, other common words, 
Positive energy, good vibes, manifest, visualize, chakra, gurus, channeling, Reiki healing, Kundalini, which I submit to you probably is the most dangerous, perverted thing on all of this stuff I didn't even talk about tonight. Mantras, third eye, theosophy, um, it's Anton LaVey and Madame Blavatsky, and magic with a K. So back in the early 1900s, you had Aleister Crowley. The Beatles wrote a song about him, right? Mr. Crowley and all that stuff. He was on the cover of Sgt. Pepper and all that. Um, he was a Satanist. He wasn't just a Satanist. He was the Satanist. He hoped that in his lifetime that he would be the Antichrist. He obviously was not. Um, this guy, if you remember Spirit Cooking, when all those wiki documents came out a few years ago, he's the guy who invented Spirit Cooking. He is a hardcore Satanic pedophile. He would be one of Jeffrey Epstein's number one clients if both were alive today. And he wanted to distinguish his dark magic, his demon worship magic, from the David Copperfield, Harry Houdini, Penn and Teller, you know, sleight of hand, hocus pocus, abracadabra magic. So I'm telling you, man, if your kids or grandkids are reading books and you, they're using magic, spelling with a K, they're referring to the real thing, not to the, just the hocus pocus stuff. Be on the lookout for that. He was really good friends with Anton LaVey, Madame Blavatsky, the people who literally started the Church of Satan in California, like the actual Satanist, Luciferianism. Have nothing to do with occult objects and idols. If you have something in your house, I don't care if it's yin and yang, just throw it away. Get rid of it. Be like the church in Ephesus who burned like $4 million worth of um, pagan books. 50,000 pieces of silver in Acts 19. Get rid of it. Don't have crystals. Don't have tarot cards. Don't have Ouija boards. Don't have meditation candles. Don't have dream catchers. Don't have enneagrams. Don't have organized. Those are the pyramids. And yes, don't have yoga accessories. Well, I bought my yoga mat. I don't use it anymore. Is it okay? I paid $10 for it at Walmart. I, I don't care where you got it from or if it was on sale. What did you do with it? If you were using it for... Exercise, what, your poses? You mean the poses of the demons? If a Muslim spent the night at your house and he forgot his prayer rug to Allah and he left and went back to some Middle Eastern country, he's like, oh, I'll just keep it. Would you? Or would you get rid of it? Because he's worshiping a false god. I wouldn't want that in my house. Again, you want to go exercise? Great, go do it. It's wonderful. God knows I should. But not like that. Not like that. And if you have a problem with that, I, I'm more than happy to, again, you want to come up and tell me afterwards why I'm wrong, I, I, I'm more than happy to hear you. Well, we have freedom in Christ and all. Yeah, yes, you do. But will you let your freedom cause another brother to stumble? Look, not everything will appear dangerous. Sometimes it may appear neutral or even beneficial. That doesn't mean that it is. Satan masquerades as an angel of light, his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But they are not. So what does all of this mean? It means ultimately we need to use some discernment. The spiritual war is real, and Jason's going to come up in a few minutes and talk about that. The enemy is after us and our families in a way is completely new to American history, right? Most of your kids and grandkids don't even know what bathroom to use. So don't tell me the war isn't real, okay? His church needs to, be, needs to wake up and to be aware of Satan's schemes. Um, we need to be seeking God by means of daily prayer, Studying, I didn't say reading his word, studying his word. Be part of that 10% that actually reads their Bible every day and studies it and knows it and memorizes it. It, it, it changes your life deeply. And be, join a strong Bible believing church. There are some awesome churches represented in this room. If you don't have a church family, this place is always welcome. Um, Porter Mountain here, uh, Pine Top Baptist, Sholo Baptist. There are some great churches on this mountain. Um, any one of those pastors would be happy to discuss these things with you. I'll be around afterwards if you want to talk about them as well. Find mature believers to surround yourself with. It's so important in, in these days. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Yeah.